three, two, one, and uh, we're live. This is uh, episode five of Finance Musings with yours truly. Thank you to to uh, new listeners, old listeners. Uh, also, guys, please click on the link below uh, to subscribe so you can get updates for new episodes. Whether you're watching this on listening to this on Spotify or wherever you get your pod- podcast, SoundCloud, make sure to follow on there. Uh, if you're on YouTube, subscribe and then you know click on the link to get onto my um, you know the e- email newsletter so you guys get all this stuff every week. But <clears throat> anyway, with that being said, the markets have been crazy. Um, but there's a lot of stuff I want to cover in a few in upcoming episodes, primarily stocks that I've taken you know decent positions in, uh, moving my cash into some of those companies. And again, this isn't this, it's not necessarily advice because I, I can't do that, but I can tell you kind of where I'm putting my money and my thoughts on on certain companies and and why I'm putting my money into them in terms of long-term secular uh, thematic reasons, right? Um, But today, there was a really, something that I want to cover on the screen right now. So folks who are listening, I'm going to be going over um, something that Jeremy Grantham, he's a big, he's a big investor. So I'm sure a lot of you know him to a lot of my listeners, whether in college or, you know, outside, but he had a really good article that came out uh, last week. It's called a let the wild rumpus begin approaching the end of the first U.S. bubble extravaganza housing, equity, bonds and commodities. And this was a pretty loaded article. It was it was a really, really good read. I'll put the link below, um, you know, wherever you're watching this. If you're listening to this, obviously, just Google it or, you know, if you're subscribed, you'd get the link. But point is, I'll, I'll, put, made the, I'll make the link available to the extent that I can. Um, and uh, I thought I'd be able to talk about this article in, in one episode. But it is very long, um, so I kind of I'm gonna probably break it up into two pieces. He kind of has like his introductory parts, kind of his summary and his thoughts on the markets, and and he does a really good job of explaining what what was really eye opening for me, and I really appreciate it. It was just kind of his thoughts on, um, <clears throat> excuse me, his thoughts on the market right now, on bubbles, on kind of a, a two sigma bubble, three sigma bubbles, and I'll kind of define how he defines those. But um, really good stuff there. So I'm going to I'm going to dive right into it. You know, something that they uh, and, and when I refer to they, I'm referring to his company, his investment team, something that, you know, just at the onset, let's think about this. Right. He describes the fact that, you know, bubbles happen and, you know, a bu- every bubble is unique. Um, they have its own characteristics and they're rare and specific to it only. What he's suggesting now is that you know we're in something called a super bubble territory which is where you have two or more um asset classes that are in a bubble at the same time and what he's arguing here is that hey um you know a standard bubble is something that's uh buoyed by low interest rates uh high bond prices and you know that could be one bubble but what he's saying here is that hey you know in a standard bubble, that might lead to, you know, a bubble in housing. Uh, you might have a bubble in commodities that might be due to supply chain issues, which is what we've seen uh, in 2020 going into 2021. But those issues aren't being reflected in the market um, as they should because of some of the help the market has been getting. Right. Um, so. What he talks about that, you know, for me, I haven't really thought about this a lot. I think a problem with a lot of people today, and I don't, I'm not trying to call anyone out specifically, but a lot of commentators on TikTok, on IG, and they make all these reels, uh, and, and, and they think in 30 seconds you could be like, hey, look, the market's down now, but guess what? In, in 10 years, it's going to be high, it's going to be higher, right? But the problem is, is that um, the problem is that the the unforeseen problem is that these bubbles have a real uh impact right and the real impact that they have is that they truly do deflate and mark down wealth right and they overstate what true wealth is right and when you think about things like that is that who has allowed these bubbles to be born right and is there something that can be done to stop it from bad economic policy or good economic policy and before i get into that and he he does go in on greenspan and bernanke Bernanke, excuse me, and Janet Yellen, and he has very choice words uh, for them. Going back to what I'm sa- what I said earlier about the damage that these bubbles cost, and um, he has some really interesting data at the bottom where he talks about how, you know, for these bubbles, once they reverse, 
not only is it like, hey, let's they're going to get back to what they were before the bubble, but they're going to get markedly below what those benchmarks were, and it may never recover, right, to an extent from where you entered into those asset prices, right? So that's something that's that's uh, really important to, to go into. But um, I'm going to get right into it. The one thing that I wanted to talk about that for me was like extremely concerning, and I think for a lot of younger people is uh, – where is it right here? Um, okay, yeah, it is right here about high priced assets and low priced assets, right? So what he's describing here is that our wealth, right? So you talk about people who work normal jobs or whatever, right? Your wealth isn't compounding at the rate of the bubble that's being born, right? That's like, so if you look at, hey, how are house prices increasing? How are asset prices increasing, right? And at, at a at a high level, you're like, hey, Sajan, that's that's common sense, right? Like that's always been happening and, and people below a certain income level feel the brunt of that, right? But that's important to understand is that like what are real asset prices? Because like 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 we said, wealth isn't compounding at the rate of the bubble and our incomes are 100% falling behind because it just isn't growing, right? So that's going to increase that inequality um, that's inherent <clears throat> because these real assets are costing more and more. And guess what people like us, and I say us, you know, I'm, I'm included in that too. We don't own these things, right? And what's important to understand is when he talks about super bubbles is that these is, this is not just the bubble in um, equities, right? It's across multiple assets um, that's gonna make this fall harder. And the tricky thing is, is like, when is the party going to stop? And because we don't know that, right? You could say a correction may have started in like spring, summer 2021 in the equities market. I'd say there was probably a noticeable sell off pretty much in my opinion. He says February 2021, and I'm sure they have some data to back it up. But for me, you know, from what I can see, it's like, hey, from July 21 to August 21 is when you really start seeing a precipitous kind of fall off um, in equities, particularly at the riskier end of the spectrum, which is what, you know, he gets into too, is that, hey, those growth stocks get beaten up first. And then people are like, hey, I have to do this. I'm going to I'm going to get impacted by this anyway, but I'm going to go to safer securities. And then it, then they kind of get to those um, those stocks. Right. <clears throat> but there's a chart in here that really, really. Um, that really uh, highlights this. Right. And this is something that I've never really thought about. I've never really even come across this. Right. Is where he says like these 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 super bubbles. Um, they're characterized by blow off, right? And what he's saying, and this this is actually exactly, if you look right here um, for the for the S and P five hundred, this is where he's talking about how um, there's an acceleration of stock price growth to maybe three x to what it was, um, of whatever the average preceding bull market run was, right? And essentially, this is what happened, right? This is probably around twenty like late 2019 early 2020 which is probably march 2020 this is probably um june 2021 um and hey what is that correction going to look like right and that's where he's saying is that that is how you identify hey what is this major bubble coming up and that's and look for them they've been really really right on a lot of things their track record is quite impeccable uh, if we see right here, hey, like 1989, um, you know, when Japan kind of had their lost decade and, and they had a double bubble of not only equity growth, uh, an equity bubble, but also in the housing market, 1999. Obviously, we all know dot com crash, 06, 07, 08, you know, housing market crashes. And then there was a kind of immediate drop off in stocks. But again, stocks in 07, 08 weren't necessarily in a bubble. They were just a little overpriced, but you could see what the impact of a bubble in the housing market had on stocks in 2008, 2009, right? Uh, and then now 2022 is this quote unquote equity super bubble, right? Um, so their track track record is pretty impeccable, but that's something that, you know, I never really thought about. Like I've never really come across, uh, and I'm just trying to find it again, is, um, you know, this concept of stock market super bubbles have blow off tops right that's something that i and i guess i fall to this is right a lot of people in my generation you think things are just gonna go up right and he had a quote in here i'm gonna try to find it let me do a quick little control f the final feature right here so this is really where does he go to 
this is exactly what I was speaking to earlier, right? The final feature of the great super bubbles, <coughs> excuse me, has been a sustained narrowing of the market and unique underperformance of speculative stocks, many of which fall as the blue chip market uh, rises. This has occurred in 1929, in 2000, and is occurring now. A plausible reason for this effect would be that experienced professionals who know that the market is dangerously overpriced yet feel for commercial reasons <laughs> they must keep dancing prefer at least to dance off the cliff with safer stocks um this is why at the end of the great bubbles it seems as if the confidence excuse me confidence termites attack the most speculative and vulnerable first and work their way up sometimes quite slowly um to blue chips right so this is really interesting, right? Because this then as an investor, you have to ask yourself is like, are you safe, right? And where do you put your money then, right? Because it's like, hey, we know and we're acknowledging the reality that we're facing. But that's what he says here too. He's like, look, the most important and hardest thing to define, um, to define quality of a late stage bubble is kind of like, hey, you have this crazy investor behavior, which believe me, we have had, right? You've had EV stocks, like he says, um, meme stocks, GameStop, you know, AMC as examples, and then obviously all sorts of cryptocurrencies and NFTs right now in kind of early 22, where like NFTs, I feel like have just gone insane, right? I wish I could print an NFT and like, it's insane. What's, you know, how that psyche translates to different asset classes and people think that they're going to act the same way, which they don't. Right. Um, so what's the takeaway from that right what's the, what's the takeaway from that it's like okay the party's over and it's gonna get worse right and it might get even way worse right so how do you deal with that one view of that and and he'll counter this in his points later is you know my view is like hey there are still strong growth companies with strong balance sheet that are cash flow positive um that have strong business cases um have strong operating models have founder-led management um or management that's been there from the start and that I think <clears throat> the intersection between value and growth can get a gray area with certain companies because some companies you could argue can be defined as growth value, right? I think, I think at the end of the day, you have to decide is like, okay, let's put terminology aside. Does the company have a uh, positive cash flow? Does it have a growing cash balance? Um, does it have, is it capturing market, um, excuse me, is it capturing scale in terms of its ability to reach new customers? Again, what's the makeup of management? What do revenue forecasts look like? What is their operating leverage, right? What are their fixed to, you know, um, operating leverage again, just fixed to variable cost. Um, and the more fixed costs that they have that either decrease at scale or just go away as the business matures and they get better technolo technological improvements, what, what have you and variable costs might only be tied to, you know, let's say labor demand, and, and maybe that's offset by the growth of the company, um, and maybe variable spend could be related to, um, you know, meeting demand or whatever. The point is, is that they have a good handle on operating leverage, right? Maybe CapEx is limited, or maybe they do have CapEx spend every year in terms of building factories or R&D spend, which again is fine because in theory that does, your revenue is only tied to how much you innovate and grow. So that's also that. So a little bit of a tangent, but the question to, to come out of this is like, okay, hey, Sasha, this guy's spelling doom and gloom, right? From the get, like, what are we, what are we supposed to do about that, right? And you kind of have to make that decision on your own. Uh, you know, for me, I think the belief is that, yes, there might not be growth in growth. You know, you might see, you might see stagnation, right? You might not see that while you see value stocks kind of bridge the gap. And there was something that they said that uh, between 2000 and 2003 value versus growth, it, it almost value beat growth by almost a hundred percent. So, you know, can you exploit this growth bubble that's happened? And, you know, that's the thing is like, how do you, how do you balance that in your portfolio in the stocks that you pick, um, you know, excuse me and, and so forth. Right. But, um, that was really important to, to get that across is that let's make no mistake that, you know, we are in um, a, a super bubble uh, across multiple things and multiple things being that, hey, 
There's a bubble in housing. There's a bubble in, in the stock market. And there's a bubble in commodities, right? And uh, there's a bubble in alternative assets, if you want to call that too, right? Uh, which, again, NFTs, cryptos, what have you. But I want to touch on his definition of what bubble and a super bubble means, right? So they did some real homework. They looked at, so you know how I said two sigma moves, three sigma moves. Um, they looked at data from, you know, I, I don't know how far back they went, but they I, when they say, I guess, asset classes over financial history, I'm, I'm assuming they look back to like, hey, the start of the Dow Jones index, right? Which from its onset was just like industrial, like railroad companies and banks, right? But again, they probably started at that and they said over a hundred years. So I'm assuming, you know, 1920s, right? Or whatever. And essentially what they found, and this is what was very startling and what we have to remember as investors, they, that, um, and I'm trying to find the exact quote, is that every single example of a two sigma equity bubble in the last hundred years has eventually fully deflated with the price moving all the way back to the trend that existed prior to the bubble forming. So again, that literally means is that that growth that you might experience in whatever that time period of that bubble in, uh, occurring those two to three years, that's gone, you know, completely. Um, and bubble forming right here. Yep. I think they have a graph. So I'm just pulling it up for the people who are watching. So, so this is what really hurts, right? So, so whether the bubble hits a two Sigma, three Sigma or higher, which I don't even, I don't even know how you get the four or five Sigma, it still falls all the way back to the trend, which means you're incurring enormous asset value loss perceived and real because it could have been real wealth if you were able to get out, but it's your perceived of what you think your wealth is that you have now lost. That is truly damaging. And Oh yeah, he actually says it right here. You know, the key here is that two things are true. The higher you go, the lower the expected future return. You can gorge on your cake now, or enjoy it piece by piece into the distant future, but you can't do both. Two, the higher you go, the longer and greater the pain you will have to endure to get back to trend. In the current case, to trend value about 2,500 on the S&P 500, adjusted for the passage of time, blah, 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 current, whatever. So that's the hard part is rationalizing that, hey, we know we're in a three sigma super bubble and it, I say it has reached its peak and it's falling down but how much further is it going to go? Because we've seen the bubble crash in one asset class, but it's only what he's saying that that crash has only happened at the tail end at the riskiest part of the assets, which is growth stocks. And it's going to work its way up, right? As these, all these other pressures, right? Of, um, uh, of pricing pain for customers, right? Uh, the housing market, real price increases, all that stuff is going to start impacting consumers. And then those consumers, who spend money on these blue chip companies, right? They're gonna then, uh, it's like the, the example you gave the termites, right? It's gonna slowly start working its way up. So it's like, we're starting to see the, we've seen the bubble crash in growth stocks and it's gonna continue to happen. But what happens when it works its way up to more blue chip companies, right? How does the environment look like then? And then at which point in time does the housing market collapse? Um, that's also really important. Again, this is all, if, it, if they all burst at the same time, right? And that's something to consider. Um, so look, it seems like it's all doom and gloom. Uh, I don't think that to be the case. I could be totally wrong. Um, and when I say I don't think that's the case, I'm saying I don't know if everything's going to explode at the same time and we're going to find ourselves in a situation where, and he had some interesting statistics and, and I'll get to it as I work, get further down. Yeah, and, I'll, and actually I'll get to it right now. So this is what I was going to say is the dangers of multi, this is literally what I was getting to the dangers of multiple asset bubbles at the same time is that not only is it dangerous to have a bubble in equities, which is fine, but what happens when you have a bubble in housing coupled with a, uh, a bubble in the stock market altogether? Now the research that they showed was that I, that I thought was very interesting is in, in 2006, um, 2007, 2008, 2009, kind of the start of the, the peak of the housing and then when everything crashed is that one, the U S hasn't faced a stock market crash and housing market crash at the same time. Sorry, bubbles at the same time. People's like, Hey, oh wait, we had that. No, we had a bubble in the housing market and equities were mildly overpriced, but equities coming down by 50% was a result of the housing bubble bursting. Now imagine if there was a housing bubble that burst 
with growth stocks that burst at the same time. And that's the point that Jeremy's trying to push through. So, but this is what is crazy is right today. Um, houses in the U S are at the highest multiple of family income. So, you know, when we value companies, we're like, Hey, what is it trading on an EV, EBITDA, EV revenue, multiple, whatever that today in 2022, even after a record gain of 20%, um, and even ahead of what we were in 20, 2006 houses today are at the highest multiple of family income ever. That's insane. I'd love to actually get, um, you know, like what multiple, like what is, I mean, let's say that what's the median income, right? Like depending on where you are in America geographically, because I feel like certain states and certain cities obviously skew median income. Excuse me. But let's say median income is anywhere from 50,000 to 100,000. I'm saying 100,000 because if you're on the East Coast, you're on the coastal areas. But let's say you're 50 to 100K, right? And you're buying a house, say four or 500K, 400, 500,000. Um, let's say anywhere from 300,000 to 600,000, right? So right off the bat, if you're making 50K uh, and you're buying a 30K, a $300,000 house, what is that? 6X, you go all the way up to 60,000. I mean, 600,000, that's 8X. Um, I don't know if that's what he's referring to. I'm just trying to do some rough math of what type of multiples he could be looking at. Um, but I want to get back and, and kind of tap here, multiple asset bubbles, right? So one housing market, very clear cut. We know we're in a bubble. We just don't know where this is going to go. The second thing is that he does talk about is that the idea that retail investors that are now just getting in into the market, everyone believes that, Hey, the market is only going to go up that that has never been a prevailing idea that like, Hey, this is the only thing that's going to happen. And this is the danger of, I see so many people on TikTok and all these like people who they got into stock picking quote unquote in like 2019, end of 2018, 2019 and 2019, we had a bit of a re recession. And, and that's kind of when kind of the bull run started, right? Let's say end of 18, 19. And then, you know, we had kind of stopped at COVID and then we are where we are today. Everyone who's on TikTok and IG talking about stocks, they got in right as a gravy train just kept going up. So in their mind, they're just like, oh, growth stocks, cool tech companies, everything's just going to keep going up. In reality, they have no fucking idea what they're talking about. They just don't. They, they really don't. I don't know if they've ever looked at like, you know, the risk factors in a 10K before. So I'm not trying to call anyone out, but they've probably caused like legitimate like asset losses. They've probably caused their followers millions of dollars in losses collectively in aggregate because they were probably pitching just stocks left and right just like oh yeah stocks just keep going up it's you know whatever yeah tesla it's like mm, maybe do a little bit more research than just like you know pushing a stock because everyone else is talking about it so that's like my frustration is like man there are millions of people out there who listen to these people on youtube and ig and tiktok and it's like mm, you know how much work and analysis is that person really doing who's just telling you to go buy tesla right uh, not that Tesla's not nothing against I'm in Tesla, nothing against them personally. And I mean, I do have some qualms um, of how they make their money and, and how they're actually doing. But that's for another video. Um, the uh, the last thing is this. This is crazy. This is really concerning. And this is uh, it's scary. OK, so. <laughs> And we taking the words out of my mouth, right? And fourth, as as grave we, gravy as if we needed any, we have broadly overpriced or above trend commodities, including oil and most of the important metals. In addition, the UN index global food prices is at around at all time high. These high prices are important as they push inflation and stress real incomes. What did I, what was I talking about earlier, right? As this starts to happen, right? Real and perceived wealth gets impacted. You have the growth. Uh, you have a bubble in growth equities. There's this bubble in housing. Who knows how that's going to play out? What's happening, right, as all this stuff is going up, what's not increasing is purchasing power and income, right? Now, you can make an argument if, like, income's increased and kind of stayed status quo, then it kind of doesn't matter because it's still one for one in terms of price increase with income increase. But we're not getting the income increase. And if anything, that, pur that purchasing power is now decreasing. So you're now stressing real incomes. Now, this combination... Uh, that you saw in 2008 because and you see it and like this is insane this chart is crazy right if we look at this chart right here this is probably like start of 08 and this is probably mid 2009 um right maybe yeah probably end of 2009 and if you see where we are right now 
you say 2020 this is March 2020 and this is probably I'm pretty sure this is end of uh, 2021 so that cliff is coming right we just don't know how sustained that cliff will be if it'll just be a blip and it's a correction and then it'll it'll go down again you know you don't know but these are important things I think the takeaway is not to be scared and kind of live in fear it's more to be again understanding that hey there are things that are out of your control inflation rates supply chain uh commodity prices supply demand of goods food um income uh like real income ability to you know for real income growth and income purchasing power there are things that are out of your control but what is in your control right what you can do is again diversify right i tell everyone who's out here trying to pick stocks and look i can be i'm not that's what i do too right but at the same time it's understanding that hey if you have a hundred percent let's say you have a hundred dollars right of cash for your cash portfolio fine it's fine if you take 25 dollars of that or even 50 dollars and you want to go and try to pick individual winners or whatever but that remaining 50 percent why are you trying to beat the market when you can own the market and you can like you know what hey i don't know how growth is going to perform i don't know how value is going to perform i don't know how this sector is going to perform but i can hedge my bets and it'd be like hey over a 10 20 year period hey let me have 25 percent in value let me have 25 percent in growth because you know you're not to the individual retail investor you're not some hedge fund that can be run a complex long short strategy and what that means is that you might be long a certain group of strong value stocks and then you might be shorting certain growth stocks that are overvalued most people aren't in a position to do that because they just you don't have that wherewithal you don't have the knowledge you just don't have you, you can't do that right um so why not be smart and let's cut that pie into four pieces right 25 25 percent is in, in in a value uh, oriented growth a value index fund 25 in a growth index fund maybe 25 percent some sector you're interested in then maybe you leave that other 25 for like individual names that you're strong on and, and maybe that other 25 instead of a sector specific index fund you could use that for like alternative stuff right maybe you want to put yourself into certain reits or dividend stocks or maybe cryptocurrencies or whatever but the idea is not to tie up that entire asset allocation into one thing right so look there's a lot more i literally have not even scratched the surface of it but um i'll get into that in the next episode just a quick preview he does go to town i'm, I'm really excited to keep uh digging into this because what he does is kind of like how we got here really gets into greenspan and uh bernanke and yellen and um could the central banks worldwide and in the u.s have done better not to let us get to where we are but then you, you, it's tricky you get into regulation and deregulation and kind of how we got here um and there's a lot of good stuff um but i will tackle all of that on the next episode so i will see you guys later peace